All right, guys, here we go. Zach is originally from New Orleans, Louisiana. He began as a chemical engineer at LSU. After a couple of years, he realized that he wanted to take his life in a different direction. This led him to packing everything up and moving to Houston to pursue a degree in finance at UH. Even then, the traditional route of a normal finance major didn't seem like the right fit. That's when he found Quest. He started his career at Quest over four years ago in Quest's internal auditing team. This meant that he led a team that looked over every investment that came through Quest. He learned in detail how these investments are structured. After that, he joined the IRA specialist team, which he is currently on. This allowed him to get a different perspective. Now, not only does he know how, how most investments are structured at Quest, but he also now gets to take a deep dive into the networking and business development that make these deals possible. Quest has had a profound impact on his life and the way he views his own personal investments for the future. Zach, welcome, my man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again, guys. Um, and that's true. Honestly, you know, working here, I didn't, I didn't exactly think this was going to be uh, this long of a tenure here at Quest. I really thought it would be just a stepping stone to the next place. But once, once I was in, you know, I kind of uh, fell in love with the, the company culture. And like I said, it really has changed the way I even think about my personal investments. Um, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. So let me go ahead and get started right here. All right. Can you guys see the screen? Perfect. Yep, we got it. And right, guys, so type your questions in the chat. And uh, Zach, if you want me to stop you throughout, let me know. But I think that we, we should just wait until the end, I guess, because you only got 20, 25 minutes or so. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we'll just, I'll get through this and we'll wait till the end and we'll get into the nitty gritty if we want to take a deeper dive. Awesome. All right, guys. So, like I said, before we, before we get started, I uh, got to give the disclaimer, everything you're about to see here is for your educational purposes only. Uh, when you're working with Quest, it's important to understand the role that we play here. We're really here to facilitate just about any type of transaction that you could have within your IRA and really offer as many resources and as much education as we can. But that being said, we don't offer any sort of tax, legal investment advice, nor do we sponsor any specific investments. So a little bit about us before we get started. We're the largest self-directed IRA custodian in the state of Texas. We have roughly 20,000 active investor clients all across the country, operate in all 50 states plus seven different countries. We have 2.7 billion in assets under administration, over 100 employees, 34 of which are certified IRA service professionals. And as it stands right now, we have about $407 million or $470 million in undirected cash sitting in our clients' accounts. Now that's the real key right there. That's the opportunity, right? Whether you know you're part of that quest pool or your syndicator needing funds, that's where that's where the action will happen. So in order to get a real foundation of how these self-directed IRAs work, it's important to understand how the IRAs views every type of entity that's in the US. All right. Every entity is going to fall under one of two categories, taxable, and then obviously on the flip side, non-taxable. So under that taxable column, it's going to be really you and anything you establish. So you go to work, you're in W-2 income, 1099, Schedule C. Well, you're taxed on that income as you make it. Next, let's say you start making some investments and you want to get a little bit of asset protection. So you found an, or you established an LLC. Well, that LLC is also going to be considered a taxable entity. This extends further. If you want to start a business and establish as a C-Corp or an S-Corp, those are also going to be taxable entities, either as the entity itself or pass through to the owners of the entity. And this even includes things like trusts, so like a land trust, personal property trust. Those are gonna be considered taxable entities. Now, on the flip side, non-taxable, generally speaking, when I say non-taxable, the first thing that comes to mind is gonna be a charity, nonprofit organization, a church, right? But your self-directed IRA falls under this non-taxable category. This is also going to include things like the qualified retirement plans. So your 401ks, 403bs, TSPs, those are also going to be considered non-taxable. And this even includes things like the solo 401k, which can be self-directed just like the IRA can. Now, now that we know we're operating in this non-taxable space, what is self-direction? Right? What is a self-directed IRA? Guys, it's really just a marketing term, right? That term self-directed it's just to illustrate that you're the one in control, right? Your investors are the one in control of their accounts. So they, may, they are the ones picking the investments, dictating when they pull out, 
when they want to hold off, they have full control. They're in the driver's seat. All right. There's no legal distinction between your self-directed IRA quests versus your IRA at Fidelity, Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade. The only real difference is what you're allowed to invest in. So the, the, the custodian themselves. So now that we know that term self-directed is really just a marketing term, well, what types of accounts can be self-directed? At Quest, they fall under three different categories. We have seven different accounts falling under three different categories. The first of which is gonna be the personal accounts. Now, these are the ones you've heard of, everyone just, just about everyone has heard of, the traditional and the Roth IRA. Now, by far the most popular account at Quest and in the United States is gonna be that traditional IRA. Not necessarily because it's better, I don't think that's the best way to think about it, because they're each gonna play their own individual role. But the reason that traditional IRA is so popular because of its pre-tax status. So whenever you're looking to move funds over from that qualified retirement plan, unless you specify otherwise, the, the contributions you've been making have been pre-tax contributions. And so when you're moving it over, you're looking to avoid any sort of tax burden. And so you're rolling it over to a pre-tax account like that traditional IRA. Once they're in there, they're growing tax deferred. So you get the full return on investment and then down the road, you get to take distributions taxable as income. On the flip side, it's gonna be the Roth IRA, right? That's the post-tax account. Personally, my favorite account because that post-tax status gives it two distinct advantages. The first one is that contributions can come out tax and penalty free regardless of your age. It's contributions you've made directly to the Roth IRA. Second is that because it's post-tax, those funds are growing tax-free within your account. That's tax-free growth. So that down the road, as long as you're uh, over the age 59 and a half, you've had a Roth open for five years or more, you get to take out those distributions, tax and penalty-free, regardless of your return on investment. That means there is no limit to how much you can grow within that Roth IRA and then take out tax and penalty-free. Now, second category is gonna be our employer plans. I'm not gonna spend too much time going over these. Just know that these are for self-employed individuals who are looking to take advantage of the higher contribution limits that come with these three accounts. And it's gonna be the SEP, the Simple, and the Solo 401k. The SEP generally is for people who have maybe one to two employees or it's just them. The Simple, usually a little bit larger, you're looking at five to six employees. And then the Solo 401k actually is specifically designed to only be for you as the employer with no full-time employees, the only exception being your spouse. And finally, third category is gonna be the specialty plans, the Coverdell ESA and the HSA. Again, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on these, just know that these are not retirement plans. They're accounts that are meant to, to benefit you now. They can be self-directed just like the traditional and the Roth, the SEP Simple Solo 401k it can even be partnered with those accounts. But these are meant to alleviate the stresses that come with education for your children as well as medical expenses, right? And we're talking everything from over-the-counter, prescription, dental, vision, can all be paid for tax and penalty-free with that HSA. So with that in mind, knowing that these accounts can be self-directed, why should you, all right? Why should you self-direct an IRA? Well, the main reason all right, there's three main reasons. The first one we like to focus on is going to be diversification. This gives you that true, true diversification. When you talk to your financial advisor, generally speaking, they're going to say, okay, let's diversify your portfolio a little bit. You know, let's get you in some low yield, low risk mutual funds. Maybe we'll buy some really valuable, you know, blue chip stocks and we purchase some bonds, right? Well, as long as you're in the public sphere, you're kind of just putting your, ed your eggs in different parts of what is overall the same basket, all right? But the self-directed IRA to custodian like Quest, what it allows you to do, it allows you to get that real distance, that separation from the public market, so you're investing into privately held assets. Second reason, it's gonna be the tax savings. So generally speaking, whenever you're making your investments, right, specifically when we're talking about real estate investments, whenever you get the return on that investment, you have one of two choices. Either A, you take the tax hit there, and then you reinvest what's left over, or B, you try to put it into a 1031 exchange and defer those taxes down the road. But when we're doing that, that 1031, we're really, we're really restricted as to what we can do. 
right? There's limitations on the type of investment you can pursue with that 1031 or put the funds in that 1031. There's restrictions on the value of investment and there's restrictions on the timeline of the investment within that 1031. With these accounts, by their very nature, they're negating the need for that 1031 because they're designed to already be tax deferred or in some cases like the Roth IRA or the Roth portion of the solo 401k, they're growing completely tax free. That's a distinct advantage that working within these retirement accounts can offer. And finally, guys, investing in what you know best. So like I said before, most people have a qualified retirement plan. You have a 401k, you have a 403b, TSP, something out there. But if I had to ask, could you really tell me what those funds are invested in? I mean, you might know a general idea. You might know that's in a mutual fund, but can you tell me the exact factors that are dictating the value of your retirement? All right, guys, it's the pool of funds that's going to determine your quality of life down the road. You know, this is arguably the most important pool of funds that we have. So why wouldn't you leverage, leverage the information and the foundation that you've built as a real estate investor, whether you're a veteran investor or someone who's just building that foundation now? Why wouldn't you leverage that knowledge to take those funds and build the type of retirement that you see, that you envision, really allow you to take control of that retirement? Now, the IRS isn't going to give you all these advantages without putting some restrictions on the account. So let's take a look at what those restrictions are. These fall under three categories. They're gonna be your people restrictions, your transaction restrictions, and your investment restrictions. Thankfully, the IRS has given us a very simple graph to understand. It's the IRS guys, it'll never ever be simple, but thankfully at Quest, we've broken it down to a pretty pal palatable uh, way to digest it. So let's take a look at the first one, the people restrictions, otherwise known as disqualified persons to the IRA. At the very top of that list, believe it or not, is you, yourself. At first, it might seem weird, but really think about it. These accounts are meant and designed to benefit you down the road. If you could benefit now from these accounts, well, it kind of just becomes like a brokerage account, right? It kind of just becomes another investment vehicle that you're working with now. So in order to cut that line, the IRS is going to make sure that you are never benefiting, nor is your IRA ever benefiting from you, All right? So best way to think about it is that you guys can never be on opposite sides of the transaction, that line in the middle representing the transaction. On this list of disqualified persons, it's going to be you, your spouse, your lineal ascendants, so parents, grandparents, your lineal descendants, so children, grandchildren, their spouses, are any companies that those people own, control, manage, or are highly compensated by. Why these people are on this list and not lateral, notice I didn't say uncle, aunt, brother, sister, cousin, it has to deal with the flow of inheritance. The IRS does not want you really investing into a fund that you're going to inherit. All right, so if I had a child, more than likely they're gonna be the ones getting my inheritance and they're investing in, with my IRA and building my IRA. They're kind of just building an account that they're going to eventually inherit. The IRS doesn't like this. And so it disqualifies those people from your IRAs. So now that we know who we can't deal with, what can't we do with them? This is where prohibited transactions come into play. So when it comes to those disqualified parties, the IRA cannot buy, sell, loan, trade, extend a service to, or receive a benefit from any of those disqualified parties, whether direct or indirect. Really what this means, like I said, just can't be on opposite sides of the transaction. If my IRA purchases a property, I can't buy that property from my IRA. If my IRA is investing, uh, or if I'm founding a business, right, I got a startup company, I can't have my IRA as an investor into my business. I can never take direct benefits from my IRA right now. And as far as investment restrictions, I didn't even make a slide for it because it's very easy to remember. It's really just two things. First one is going to be life insurance policies because they don't want you betting on someone's life. Second one is going to be collectibles. Right? These are things like vintage cars, art, alcohol, things that are hard to get a true appraisal on that can somewhat be subjective uh, when it comes to their value. Now, what can you do? within an IRA. Guys, really just about any type of investment 
that you could do personally. All right, if you want to get into the real estate space as a uh, just a single family home investor, perfect. We can do fix and flips. We can do uh, tax lien sales. We can do buy and holds as rental properties. Uh, some people pursue the Burr method. It's a little bit hard in the IRA. It's possible though. All right. Now, let's say you don't want to deal with single family homes and you just, well, you want to give your money to someone who is investing in the single family homes. Great. Be the bank. You get to lend out of your IRA. All right. You're the one in control of every single factor when it comes to this lending. You're determining interest rates. You're turning uh, maturity dates. Is the collateral sufficient? Is it going to be a secured note or an unsecured note? Is it going to be amortized or a balloon note? You have full control over how the note is structured so that you feel comfortable giving your money out. And in the worst case scenario, if you weren't to get those funds back, you at least have some form of compensation to recoup the value that you just lent out. And finally, by far our most popular investment we see at Quest is going to be syndication investments, whether that's multifamily, land syndications, whatever it is. So syndication investments are without a doubt the most popular account because of their passive nature. Right? Whenever we're looking at these syndication investments, you're giving your money out, you're letting someone take that, take those funds, whether it's like to acquire a property or to develop a property. Five years later, you're getting your funds back and you're getting a very large return on investment for very little work, all right? Now, whenever we're looking at these syndication investments, it's important to understand that how these work within an IRA, because they're gonna work a little bit differently than if you're making the investment personally. And we'll take a look at that after, let me get through the slide and that way we can take a deeper dive to exactly what those syndications look like within an IRA. All right, so now that you got your investment, well, how do you move, over? How do you move money over, all right? How do you get the money into the IRA? There's three ways to fund your IRA. First one is going to be direct contributions to the IRA. This means you're taking money out of your checking savings account and giving it to the custodian. Now, the amount that you can contribute is going to entirely depend on the type of account you're looking to open. All right, we have things, we have your normal uh, personal accounts that are 6,000 a year. If you're over 50, it goes up to 7,000. Then you have some of your employer, employer plans that can go up to 61,000 in a year. So it really will depend on the type of account that you're looking to open. The next one is gonna be a direct transfer from an IRA. So if you've got that rollover IRA that used to be an old retirement plan that's currently sitting in the market and you're not liking what it's, what it's doing and you're not hopeful about the future, you can transfer those funds from that IRA over to an IRA to custodian like Quest. Because it's a trustee to trustee transfer, it's a super easy process that's not even reported to the IRS. It's like moving funds from a checking account at Chase to a checking account at Capital One. Pretty straightforward process. And finally, the last step is going to be to roll it over from an old retirement plan. Now, the reason I stress an old one is because what we're ideally looking for is what's called a separation of service. Essentially, you just no longer work for the employer that that qualified retirement plan was through. Now, if we have that separation of service, you can do whatever you want for that money, no problem at all. If it's an active retirement plan, meaning you still work for that employer, there's some questions you're gonna to wanna to ask when considering moving funds over. First, we gotta see if it's possible. You're gonna to wanna to ask them if they allow for what's called in-service withdrawals, otherwise known as in-service rollovers. Some will allow it, some won't. It really will depend from plan to plan. Every plan is gonna be different. Next question, if they do, you're going to ask how old do you need to be in order to move those funds out? Usually it's going to be over 59 and a half. And most of the time, you're only going to be able to move over what you've contributed. Now, on the flip side, if they say no, they don't allow for in-service withdrawals, unfortunately, that's really it. There's no way of getting the money out there without some sort of tax or penalty. So now that you got your, your funds over there, how do you make the investment? Well, Obviously, I can only speak on behalf of Quest, but I can't imagine it's much different anywhere else. How it works at Quest is you're going to let us, you're going to call us and let us know that you're looking to pursue an investment within your IRA. From there, what we're going to do is we're going to ask a couple of questions, get some details about the investment, and then we'll assign a processor to you that's going to specialize whatever type of investment you're looking to make. So they're going to work with you as well as with any syndicator, borrower, title company, whoever it is, to gather up all the documentation after which we'll audit it to be sure it's in compliance and everything's vested correctly in the name of the IRA. 
And then finally, once we've got all the documents in, we can fund that investment in 24 to 48 hours. So it's a pretty streamlined process because we know how the real estate space is and we know how crucial these timelines are. We know a lot of times you've got a very narrow window to make this investment happen. And so we're going to do everything we can to make that investment happen. So that's it, guys. I wanted to keep it pretty short and sweet so that we can, we can take a deeper dive into some specific questions that you have. Overall, I want you guys to realize kind of the value that's there, right? Whenever you're making these investments, most of the time, you don't have the pool of funds just sitting in your back pocket, just sitting in a checking account that you need for these larger investments. But most of the time you do have it within that retirement account. So why not leverage those funds to build the future you have? Because I promise you've got more tire, more value in your retirement account than you realize. That's it for me, guys. There's my contact information if you want to take a picture of it. But until then, what questions do you have for me? Awesome, Zach. Thank you, man. I was just wondering, Zach. Absolutely. All right, let's rock. So um, is there a cost involved? Yes, there is. So I'll go over all the fees you'll see from the moment you open up the account all the way through making your investment. Hold on. Sorry, I got a 90-pound lab right behind me just rolling <laughs> on the floor. Oh, um, man. Yeah. Let, let's say, um, I know that you said it was really, it was pretty quick, right, to, to get it all done. But let's say we had an investor that realizes that they might want to be, you know, they might want to use this, uh, their retirement account or whatever. So I guess at that point we would patch them into you. Exactly. You guys can feel free to reach out to me directly, share my information with whoever you'd like. They just give me a call. I'll introduce myself, introduce them to Quest, you know, ask a couple of questions about where the funds are just so we can get an overall picture. And then from there, if it looks like a good fit and we can move forward, what I'll do is I'll just send you guys over an email Within that email is going to be a link to the application. Once you fill out that application online, it comes right back to me. We can have the account established in 24 to 48 hours. From there, the next step is going to be on moving the funds. Now, this will depend on where the funds are currently sitting. We like the people, we say prepare for two to three weeks. Now, it rarely takes that long, but just in case that's ideal, we've made it happen much quicker. Um, but really, it'll be dependent on the other custodian, right? how quickly they can process the transfer. But thankfully, what we can do so that we're knocking out two birds with one stone while we're waiting the fund, on the funds to get here, we'll start the investment process, right? So we'll get them assigned that processor that's going to specialize in these syndication investments. They're going to work with the syndicator as well as with our client to gather up all the documentation. Like I said, auditing it, be sure, being sure everything's in compliance, invested correctly in the name of the IRA. And that way, hopefully, as soon as the funds get here, we can go ahead and fund that investment. As a, a syndicator, when we're sending you the documentation, like the PPM and all that stuff, there are, do we send it to you or do we send it to the person, the, inv the investor themselves? For example, you're the custodian. Mm, yeah. So as the custodian, I mean, by all means, you can send it directly to us. All right. We're always going to send it to our client for their read and approved signature. We'll never fund anything without their read and approved. But um, at that point, it kind of, it really will depend, right? If you're working with someone and you know, hey, they're on top of the game, they're good communication, they're responding quickly, and I know if I send them over documents that they're going to forward them over in a timely manner, awesome. By all means, you can do that. But if you work with someone a little bit less experienced, who's kind of hesitant, they're not moving very quickly, and we have a timeline, by all means, send it over to us in an email, include them in that email, and we'll be good to go. Um, we were, what are, can you talk a little bit about the taxes? <laughs> Are there UBIT taxes or something? Is that what it's, what it's called? Yeah. So uh, when it comes to these syndication investments, it's actually a subclass of UBIT known as UDFI. That's unrelated debt financed income. So it's just a little bit of a picture of how it'll look from the investor side. Uh, generally speaking, if you were making this investment outside of the IRA, right, just you personally, and let's say it's a five-year timeline, first three years, you're getting that forced depreciation, fourth year breaks even, fifth year exit strategy. So in those first three years, if they're a real estate investor, if they're a full-time real estate investor, obviously they can claim that depreciation against their income for the year, all right? They do that for all three years. Fourth year, maybe it's negligible. Fifth year, they break even and they're taxed on that return. So now let's take that same scenario, put it into an IRA. So the IRA makes the investment. Well, the first three years, it's getting that same forced depreciation, but it doesn't have any taxable income. 
Now, that doesn't mean that those K1s just disappear. We tell our clients to hold on to those K1s. Uh, fourth year, again, breaks even or negligible. Fifth year rolls around, and now we've got the return on investment. So let's say in this given scenario that it was 70% debt leveraged, right? Because it was 70% debt leveraged, and let's say they made a $50,000 profit, that means of that 50,000, 70% of it is subject to UDFI taxes. So 35,000 of it is subject to UDFI taxes. That's not something to be worried about, just something to be aware of because now the IRA has taxable income. So it takes out those three K1s from the first three years and it'll apply that to that taxable income for the IRA. I'd say about 85% of our clients who end up uh, making these syndication investments will usually pay little to nothing when it comes to this UDFI tax, just because they were going to work with the CPA to maximize the deductions. And those K-1s are going to go a long way at minimizing the tax application that the IRA is going to experience. Right. Awesome, man. And what's the alternative? I mean, you're going to withdraw it, right? Take, take the tax at then and, and also a potential penalty. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. And that's, you know, let's say, let's say it was ideal. It was in a post-tax accounts like the Roth IRA. Well, even then you've got, you know, we've got to consider Roth ordering rules. You could take the funds out. Maybe not all of it will be taxable, but definitely some of it will be taxable. And then you're looking at the penalty on top of that. And now you take this post-tax income, invest it, and you're, you're going to have to pay taxes again on the return. Whereas all of it can be done in a tax advantaged account like the Roth or a traditional. And now you're looking at minimal, if any taxes to be paid on the return on investment, you get the full you know, most of the return to reinvest without any sort of restriction on timeline or anything like that. And then down the road, like I said, you're over the age of 59 and a half, you had it open for five years, you've got all that growth tax-free. Awesome. Hey guys, if anybody has a question, unmute yourselves, because if not, I'm going to keep going. Um, I have a quick question. Zach, um, I looked into this a little bit uh, a while back, but Correct me if I'm wrong, only certain 401k plans will allow you to do a self-directed. Is that correct? So that's when you're talking about self-directing within that 401k, right? And that's right. Only certain plans will, um, yeah. like the solo 401k, right? Solo 401k can be self-directed. But whenever we're working with our clients here at Quest, we're never operating out of an IRA or out of a 401k. We're always operating within an IRA. Right. The only type of 401k we hold is that solo 401k. And even then, it's a much different relationship between us and that 401k holder versus us and the IRA holders. But uh, so if your comp doesn't your company, your company kind of sets the rules as so if you have a W-2, mm -hmm. your company sort of sets the rules for that 401k. Um, are you saying that that I even if you the company doesn't allow that? you could somehow form a trust that it gets invested in? Or am I completely not understanding this? No, no. So the best way to think about it is remember that I, the IRA, right? It's acting at its own entity. So it's completely yeah. separate okay. from the solo four or from that 401k. So yeah. whenever you're rolling plans over, if it's an active 401k, it's going to be hard to get the funds out of that 401k. Yeah. Right. So most of the scenarios we're looking at are funds from an old retirement plan. Gotcha. So you got the funds within that active 401k. You're absolutely right. You are kind of at the whim of okay. whatever the documents okay. say. Okay. Yeah. Yep. One, one other question. Do you know anything about the, um, the hardship clause? Uh, when it came to the distributions? Yeah. When you're, so if you turn 55 and then if you're 55 year older, you've left your primary employer Mm -hmm. uh, where you can access your 401k without the 10% penalty? Yeah, I have heard of that. I'm not super familiar on it. Um, but keep in mind, that's that's going to cover direct distributions, right? So this withdrawal mm -hmm. is coming from that old retirement yeah. plan to you personally. So yeah. movement from that retirement plan to an IRA, it won't have any effect on it. Yeah, <clears throat> okay. It typically you can if if you're not no longer working somewhere right you're typically good, I, from what from my personal experience to to use you know to roll that over into something, uh, but if you're currently employed there then I I found challenges. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. It's 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 very few and far in between. In fact, since I've been working at Quest, I think I've seen it maybe once or twice where someone was working for an employer that actually allowed in-service rollovers 
immediately once they start working or, and are uh, vested in the in their in the qualified retirement plan. And even then, they can only move over what they had contributed, not what the employer had contributed. But yeah, you're right. Once you got the separate social service, you can you can do as you please. Any uh, more questions? Yeah, I may I may have missed it, but are you selling any assets when you when we take out this capital, or is it more of a loan? Uh, whenever, like at what step? Whenever you so so we it's already in the self directed IRA, and mm -hmm. we want to actually get money so that we can use for a syndication. Are you selling like some of the stocks or or? or oh, okay. So no. So keep in mind that whenever you're looking at a custodian like Quest. A lot of times what it'll be is we are strictly private assets, right? So when you're moving the funds over, they're not being invested into any sort of like mutual funds or anything like that. We're not managing. It's not like a brokerage IRA. This is strictly just going to be an independent IRA that's only going to be investing into privately held assets because that's what we as a custodian can hold. So a lot of times what will happen is our clients will have both an account with us and an account at a public custodian, right? So they move the funds that they need to invest over to us. Any excess cash, they'll move over to that other custodian. That way it can be managed and grow. And they're kind of both growing both streams at the same time. Um, as far as the actual investment goes, that we aren't, we like I said, we aren't really selling anything, right? So it's just going to be the IRA. It, it The structure of it is going to work exactly as if you were investing yourself. The only difference is on there, on the subscription agreement, it's going to show Quest Trust Company, FBO, your name, IRA, your account number. We'll send the funds out, and then the IRA will take all the funds back when it gets the return on investment. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Zach, I have a question. Hmm? Um, so if you are, let's say you're a GP on a deal, and then you also want to invest on the LP side, um, at the same time. So because you're a part of the GP team, can you do that since no. is that your deal? Okay. I figured, yeah. but I just wanted to ask. Okay. Yeah. So the best way to think about it is um, because it, because really that'll fall under that last little part of those disqualified parties, right? Any companies that you own, control, manage, or are highly compensated by. Every one of those has a different definition. Just think if you take more than 10% of the company's overall income, if you have uh, influence over the decision making of the company and then if you are over 50 percent ownership of the company if it hits one of those three you can't do it mm. okay thank you yeah absolutely great question i believe um anybody else okay, i have a i have a question yeah. you know on the ownership of the company what if it's owned by like a Wyoming LLC where are they going to ask like who the managers of it is? I mean, the manager could be another holding company. Mm -hmm. How would that work? So this is where we get into your risk versus reward, right? You bring it to Quest. So let's say, uh, let's say you as an individual, you are the, you're a single, it's a single member LLC. You find uh, ABC holding company, right? ABC Holding Company will then enter into it uh, as the managing member of an LLC, and the IRA is going to invest into that LLC. So one, two, three. Correct. Right. So whenever we look, whenever we are auditing your paperwork, what we are going to see is that the manager of one, two, three LLC is ABC Holding Company. We're not going to dive deeper than that right? Because we're looking for what's called blatantly prohibited transactions. Now, is what you're describing a prohibited transaction? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Because at the end of the day, you're still having unfettered access to the IRA's funds, right? It's You put a couple steps in between, but overall, it's the same thing as if the IRA had invested into, into you know, ABC holding company, right? So is it possible? Yes. If you get audited, it won't take very long for them to discover that. You know, they just, they look, they, once they see a holding company as the manager, next step is to look at who's the manager of the holding company, who's the members of the holding company. And they'll just kind of continue that process until they get to the, to the very top. Mm. Right. Okay. This is kind of a, it's the same thing as like, you know, 
we've had people they they purchase a property in their IRA and then they'll call saying that they want to they want to buy the property and we let them know oh you can't do it right and they'll say oh it's okay well I'll have I'll have my friend purchase the property from the IRA and I'll purchase the property from the friend is it going to work I mean yeah because we're not there's no way we know the intention I mean now that they've told me I'm going to tell them it won't work right but if they were to do it without ever letting us know there's no way for us to know that right we're going to try our hardest to protect you from prohibited transactions but the IRS will definitely see right through that. So even a friend, what if, how long would your friend have to hold it for before they sell it back to you? I wish I could give you an exact answer on that. It's going to be, it's going to be, can you prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that your friend purchased it from the IRA without the initial intention of selling it to you? Are you just buying it because an opportunity came up and it just happened to be that they purchased that from the IRA? It does that take three years, five years, 10 years? Who knows? It's a, it's a long partnership. Right, exactly. You got to play the long game with that one. <laughs> okay, got it. Thank you. Absolutely. I just want to clarify something. I want to make sure that I understood correctly. Uh, an employee that is actively uh, working, that hasn't retired yet, there's no way they can uh, invest in uh, syndication or something like that through their company, right? They cannot roll it over to an I IRA or something like that, or okay. self-directed IRA. Yeah, so they can't move over, or they generally won't be able to move over that active qualified retirement plan, right? Okay. Let's say you worked for an employer for 10 years, and then after the ten, after 10 years, you switched, and then you work for this next employer for five years, you're still currently working for them, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you can absolutely take that retirement fund that was associated with that employer that you worked for for 10 years, and roll that over to a brokerage IRA, roll it over to a self-directed IRA, um, do really as you please with that. So it's not necessarily that you have to be retired. It's that you have to have a separation of service between the employer that was associated with that qualified retirement plan. If and if the employer allows it uh, to where you can invest in a syndication, is mm -hmm. that a possibility? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but think about it. So it's not, it's not that you're asking the employer, hey, can I invest into a syndication? All right, what you're asking the employer is, hey, can I roll these funds out of this out of this qualified retirement plan? All right, that's what you're really asking them. So once they say yes to that, what you're doing is rolling it out of that qualified retirement plan into an individual retirement account. So now that individual retirement account is operating outside, completely separate from that employer. This is for you as an individual. Okay. Once it's there, you can do whatever you'd like with it. Yeah, that, I guess that's what I wanted to clarify. You do have to rule it out. Then. Okay. What if they're allowed to borrow from their 401k? Like their employer allows them to borrow. Can they borrow it to put it in a um, self-directed IRA? So yes and no. N not really would be 90% of the answer, right? Could you take those borrowed funds and make a contribution to an IRA? I mean, yes, but even then you're limited. Where most accounts will be 6000 in a year which is not going to be nearly enough what you need for a syndication, yeah. right? But you couldn't say, okay, hey, I'm going to borrow. I think it's like you can do $50,000. Um, hey, I'm going to take this $50,000 and I'm going to roll it over to an IRA because that's not what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. They're cutting a check to you as an individual. They will not cut the check to Quest because we're not the borrower. You are. So these funds have to go to you personally before they can ever reach the IRA. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, you got it. Go for it. Okay. One more question. So if you, um, if you're the, you own your own company, so you're the employer and you have a, maybe a SEP or 401k, um, however you would advise, is it, is that much easier then? So you, if you're not dealing with your employer, like working for someone and, and under their regulations, can you move that? Would, would it be easier to move that to Quest to then be able to fund a deal that way? Or is it still? So if you if you have like a SEP or a simple or solo 401k, right? That you're obviously, you're the one, you're, you're self-employed, right? Mm -hmm. And so there you're not really having to roll anything over. So if you have like a SEP open with us, you okay. as the employer are making contributions to that SEP that SEP can be self-directed just like the traditional Roth IRA, 
All right. So, so this is, no, good. We can start with you then. We can have you go directly to you and actually open a new account and keep the funds with you and mm -hmm. be ready to go. Okay. Yeah. In fact, we have like uh, we have a lot of clients who are either CPAs with small firms or like dental practices where they don't have that many employees. Um, and what they'll do is they'll set up a SEP or a simple. They'll make their employer contributions, and then if it's the simple, they can also you know the employees can also make contributions. Um, but once the funds are there, this is an account with Quest, right? So they can self-direct it as they see fit. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, I, I have a golden question. I know people have to hop off. There's another meeting coming up at eight, a few meetings. Um, but this golden question, Zach, I don't know if you have the answer to this, but what we're seeking essentially is how to find these people. How do we find people that really don't know that they have these resources, right? How, do, uh, how many are there out there? Do they, do, are there a lot of people just sitting on these old retirement accounts, right? That they don't, that are just sitting there. How do we access them? Um, I mean, really any type of networking event that you have, there are going to be people there who have a retirement plan that they probably don't don't even know what's happening in it all right more times than not i mean like i said you have a qualified retirement plan you assume someone's taking care of it and when you leave your job some people don't even realize that you have the choice to like move those funds they think they're just sitting in that 401k again right so if they've ever moved a job if they've ever left if they've ever retired quit became self-employed they're a potential client of yours you know, from there, you just really direct them our way. If you're looking for something that's specifically real estate, I mean, we have, we, we host networking events, but obviously, you know, you guys have, have your meetings. So any, I mean, most people in here are going to qualify to be able to move funds over to an IRA and either directly invest to the syndication or partner together with other IRAs to invest. All right. Cause keep in mind, if you can't make the cut solely on your account, bring some partners in, right. Now, it'll depend on from syndicator to syndicator if that's going to be allowed, but that's an idea for sure. Oh, awesome, man. I like that. So people can come together kind of like as an LLC or form an LLC. Right exactly. There. Wow. Exactly. And you just make them you know, all the IRAs are investors. And now the LLC is the one subscribing to the uh, to the syndication. Cool. All right, guys, any last questions? All right. Well, Zach, you are the man and uh, everybody here, just make sure you have his information. It has been an absolute pleasure to listen to you and to get some guidance and advice from you. So I truly appreciate having you on today, man. No, really. Uh, thank you guys for having me out. You know, we're, we're trying to spread the word as much as we can about these investment vehicles, uh, you know, especially to, to syndicator groups. I mean, these things can, these things can be absolutely invaluable. Um, so feel free to shoot me over an email, give me a, uh, give Quest a call, ask for me. I'd be happy to help share my information with all of your investors. If you'd like, I can just respond to your email with my email that has all my information. You can just forward that on, uh, on over.